It's good to see y'all here this morning at Anchor Baptist Church. We're going to get started with 257 in your hymnals. Good to see y'all here. We're going to get started with 257. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. 257. seated. All right. I'm just going to pray this morning and we'll get right into this. Lord, we love you, God. We thank you for getting us here this morning. I pray you to help me as I teach this, God. I pray I'm going to recall the materials and be able to give it to your people, Lord, to be a help to them that they might love and trust your word better through it, God, and this would be a, a benefit to them in their walk with you. I pray you bless in this time, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to briefly run through some stuff from last week. Um, I don't want to spend too much time because I want to actually move forward, and if we just live in review, <laughs> just keep reviewing. Um, but we're talking about the Greek and what the Greek is and what Greek is. And as a Christian, you don't need to be afraid of Greek. Just because we're King James only Bible even Christians, somebody says Greek out of a pulpit, and immediately you you know recoil and say, oh, they're a Bible corrector and this. And generally they are. But I don't want you to just say, oh, well, they're wrong because they use the Greek. I want you to understand why using the quote unquote the Greek is wrong, why there is no such thing as the Greek and why this book is perfect in the English. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to make it here this time, I promise. But we were talking about when Paul wrote all his letters, and Luke wrote his, and Mark wrote his book, and Matthew wrote his book. They all wrote them around in this area over in the Middle East, and as they would write it, they would make it, somebody would see it, and they'd say, oh, that's good. They'd make a copy, and somebody else would make a copy. 
and somebody else would make a copy of a copy, and then somebody else would translate it into Latin, and somebody else would translate it into Coptic, and somebody else would translate it into whatever language. And in time, you end up with all these manuscripts. And if you know anything about church history, you know that most of church history consists of the devil trying to burn the church to the ground, which means there was a lot of making copies of Bibles, and the devil making sure that those copies of Bibles got burned. So that's why when we go into manuscript evidence, there's only a couple thousand remaining ones. There's some good ones. There's some bad ones. The devil did a really good job of making sure he protected his own manuscripts. Uh, Vaticanus ended up in a library in the Vatican, and it hid there and sat there for a long time. They don't even know, nobody actually knows when Vaticanus ended up in the Vatican Library. It just got there one day. And they found it, and they said, hey, we've got a, a copy of the Bible in Greek. Now, your New Testament was written in Greek originally. And people say, well, in the originals this and in the originals that. And what you need to understand is when people go to the originals, what they're trying to do, First Timothy, When somebody says, well, in the original is this, what they're trying to do is they're trying to make themselves the authority on the Bible. Because if I can tell you the Bible should be translated this way and not that way, then that makes me the final authority of I can say what the Bible should say. You say, well, somebody else said that the Bible, the translation should be this. And it's, well, do you trust that person or do you trust me? But ultimately, you're trusting a person to tell you this is what the Bible says. When, you, when the Greek becomes your authority... And when you say, well, I'm going to learn Greek myself and be my own authority, then you have to decide, well, are you going to trust Nestles and Oland? Are you going to trust Schaff? Are you going to, what are you going to trust? Who I got here? I got Croy here. Are you going to trust Croy? Who are you going to trust? You have to pick what Greek lexicon you're going to trust and what Greek grammar you're going to trust. And you're still trusting a man in all of that. If you trust that this is the preserved word of God in the English, inspired, inherent, and all that good stuff, you don't have to say, well, I don't know what the Bible says, or I take it on brother so-and-so on what the Bible says. You just say, you know what, this is the King James Bible. It says here, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. All right, I can take that to be true. If a pastor gets up in a pulpit, a, a professor gets up in a pulpit, or a, a lecturer gets up in a pulpit, and they say anything different, you can say, well, they don't know what they're talking about because they're going against the Bible. God is not the author of confusion. And when you have 500 different final authorities duking it out to be the preeminent one in your life, you have confusion. So, getting back to all this stuff, these are all different manuscripts that survived in Greek. And what this is here is it's the New Testament in Greek. And it's an amalgamation of saying, here's all the sources that read one way, but... In this situation, there's another source that reads this way. The Sinaiticus manuscript and the Alexandrinus manuscript, they all read green, but Vaticanus reads purple. And Ephraim I reads red. And it all gets kind of amalgamated into this big, giant, ugly mess that is this. Um, the problem that you run into, well, a big problem that you run into is you get people and they say, are you, well, if you go, if you, when you deal specifically in Baptists, for the most part, you're going to run into a couple different crowns. You're going to run into King James onlyism, which is us, which is the King James Bible is the perfect, inherent, inspired Word of God in the English. You don't need any original languages to understand it better. Uh, you'll run into people who are what you call textus receptus people. They believe that the inherent, inspired, infallible Word of God is a Greek. Uh, New Testament called the Textus Receptus. It's their, they believe in the basically the Greek that is behind the King James, that the King James was translated from. They believe that that's the perfect inherent inspired word of God. For the most part, they'll be right on a lot of their doctrine. They'll preach out of a King James Bible. They'll say this is the word of God, but they don't fully believe it. And when you really corner them on it, they'll say, well, in the Greek, this. It won't be a major I general, in general, it won't be a major huge issue. You can have fellowship. It's not going to cause any major dissension like that. But ultimately, they're not Bible believers. They're Greek users. And then finally, there's people who use whatever Bible they want. And the problem with that is that if you've got an RSV and I've got an NIV and you've got an ASV, um, and I'm up here preaching, you do have confusion. Yes.
Are you, hold on, I'm not, what's the difference between those two people? So, there is, there are, learning Greek and knowing Greek, I'll say this, there's some interesting things that you can learn and you can follow in your Bible by knowing Greek, but it's not anything that you can't learn by knowing English, and it's not something that if you know this is going to help your walk with God. You can know effectually trivia. Like the Vicaris Philly, Philly D Roman numeral thing is very interesting. And it's true, but it doesn't enhance your walk with God. And when a person says the unfor- it is unfortunate that the King James translate, yes, then at that point they're saying the King James is not the authority. My understanding of Greek and manuscript evidence is the authority. So you have to, anytime a person takes the authority away from this Bible, that's when it becomes a problem. Otherwise, you know, I've referenced Greek in my preaching. I've heard other people reference Greek. As long as they're not using it to say it's better than the King James or here's something you can learn that you couldn't have learned from your Bible, um, we might do phileo, phileo, agape at one point because I love phileo, phileo, agape. It's so much fun. Um, but, it, yeah, it, it, it comes to a matter of what are they saying the final authority is and where are they going from there. You trust, when you get into the Greek and you get into, like, Kenneth Wiest's Greek nuggets, there aren't Greek nuggets. <laughs> there aren't. <laughs> um, but anyways, you have all these different manuscripts that have survived. Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus, Vaticanus, Ephremi, and then D, which is, there's two different Ds. There are, these are what you call Greek cursives. That is an entire, almost an entire New Testament written in Greek. Greek language is a little complicated. It's not awful, but it's, it's got some irregularities. Back here, when they wrote, um, you would either write in all caps or all lower cases. So these are all in all caps. Um, a lot of your minor cursives are written in all lower case with no spaces. <laughs> This is wonderful. You have to read all this stuff with no spaces in it. When you get, and when you look up the pictures of the original manuscripts and the original documents that you can actually still lay your hands on, I still have them, in the back here it tells you where all 2,000 of them are, what weird, obscure European library every last one of these is hidden away in. Um, when you get, let's see, the chart even says where they all are. And it's in Latin because they're a pain in the butt. You get all these different, man- you have all these original Greek uppercase manuscripts. These are the bigger authorities. And if you do have questions, raise your hand, please, because I know I'm talking all kinds of strange stuff. Then there's the minor ones that are written all in lowercase. Then you have, hey, a church father translated this into Coptic in 300 AD, and you've got an original Coptic, which is an Egyptian language down in here. And then somebody else translates it into Boharic, which is up in here. And there's all kinds of wonderful little idiosyncratic names. Uh, Keep in mind, when the Bible is written, everybody in the world speaks Greek, for the most part. That's the universal language. Uh, But Rome is the empire in charge, so all of the officials speak Roman. I'm sorry, Roman. Latin. So there's a lot in Latin, and when you get the union, when the Catholic Church really starts taking off, and it unites with the Roman Empire, and it becomes the Holy Roman Empire, they start sanctioning their own Latin Bibles. So you end up with Latin Bibles and Greek Bibles and German Bibles and uh, Gothic Bibles, which is uh, French. And you end up with all these different things. And some of them get survived. Some of them get used to death. Some of them get burned. And you're stuck with you know, all these, these scraps to piece together. One last one I'll get into is Church Fathers. When a man would preach a message, sometimes somebody would transcribe the whole thing. And as we're going to get into this morning, there are people who would say, I'm up here and I have Sinaiticus in my hands. I say, in the Sinaiticus, it says blah, 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 blah. Well, if somebody's transcribing my message, they would say, Ben said, in the Sinaiticus, it said 
ASTF, AOS, AGAPE, blah, 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 blah. Well, that becomes a source then because they're saying, hey, Church Father Ben, when he preached in 349 AD, said that Stadiaticus said this. Now, that gets very important into the, message, into the verse we're going to go through this morning because all of these have three to five different revisions of them where somebody sat down and said, hold on a second, Vaticanus is wrong. I need to scratch out this letter and add in the letter and scratch out this thing and add in these words. And, oh, yeah, I'm going to take a scalpel and cut out the last half of, Mar or last half of Mark 16. That's what you're dealing with. You are in a nasty, gnarled up, tangled up mess where you're fighting, you're dealing with history, you're dealing with linguistics, you're dealing with church bias and all this stuff. So the Bible says, and, uh, keep your hand in First Timothy, but in Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, we are talking about Jesus Christ, and Paul makes a very definitive, very dogmatic statement here. He's talking about Jesus and him dying for us in 14, and him in whom is redemption through his blood, even in the forgiveness of sins, which is the act that gave Jesus the name above every other name. Uh, 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So that means that everything is held together by the power of God for his pleasure. We are establishing that as fact. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. In everything, Jesus Christ wants to have the preeminence. He wants to be acknowledged. He wants to have the glory for people saying, God did this, God allowed this, God created this, God made this. In everything, Jesus Christ should have the preeminence. So, 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. The first half of this is the qualifications of the bishop, and if we have time, we'll run back to that for some, for some uh, enjoyment. Uh, but in verse 14, it says, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the, and pillar and ground of the truth, and without controversy, we are about to get into some controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now, in the light of that, is verse 16 talking about Jesus Christ? So if it's talking about Jesus Christ and it says Jesus Christ, and instead of saying Jesus Christ, it says God that means that Jesus Christ is God. It's not a jump here. It's not a stretch. It's talking about Jesus Christ. And when you get into most of your new versions, most of your new versions, and I'll tell you exactly how many of them here in a minute, say he. Now, if you make that phrase... He was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached into the world, believed on in the world, received up into glory. It is an incomplete sentence. It is grammatically incorrect. Furthermore, if you say he, you can be referring to Jesus as a man. If you change God out for he, you attack the deity of Jesus Christ. You're taking a verse out that definitively says Jesus Christ was God as if there was any doubt. But just so you know... God was manifest in the flesh. Why on earth would they say he? Well, I'll tell you why. No, nope, this will tell you why. That's my Greek homework. Don't look at that. In, the, in Greek, the word for God is theos. Theta, this is all lowercase, epsilon, 
Omicron, sigma. This is a sigma, when you put a sigma at the end, usually a sigma looks like this. When you put it at the end of the word, it looks like that. It's called a final sigma, it's just a thing. This is the Greek word theos. In the Greek, in, in Greek, I hate to say the Greek because I've said it a thousand times, it's kind of stupid. In Greek, there's something called an nomina sacra. Nomina sacra is Latin phrase for sacred name. When somebody writes the name of God in Greek, instead of writing theos, they will write, write it big, theta, sigma, and then they put a bar across the top. That is called the nomina sacra. That means this is the name of God. The Greek word for he is hos. The Greek word hos is written like that. Now, does anybody see the similarity between theos and hos? Also, usually there's, there should be, well, there's accent marks, but they didn't have the accent marks in the Greek because, again, they were trying to be difficult. Um, but that's called, that's pronounced hos and theos. Now, the Nestle Island will tell you what the Greek support is for both of these readings. And it says, Chiam, blah, 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 uh, Haas, Epsom, Merothe. And that, it says that it reads with the Haas, it reads like this in a bunch of different manuscripts. And I'm going to write them out for you. And I know this is kind of weird and dry, but I'll explain why it's important. Text. It's written like this in Aleph. Aleph star, A star, C star, F, G, 33, 365, PC, I'll tell you what PC means. PC, or some old Latin versions, some reliable old Latin versions, a guy named Didymus of Alexandria, and F, never say his name right, Greek name, Greek guy whose name starts with an E. Epiphanius, Epiphanius, his name is Epiphanius. And it says, these are all your sources. Now, that means that there's Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus, the Ephremi, another one called the F that's not as important, one other one called G, a, la, uh, a small manuscript called 33 and a small manuscript called 365. That's your source that says it looks like this. But these stars, these three stars I got here by he, that's an A, that's a Hebrew Aleph, that's a Hebrew A. Aleph, Alexandrinus, and uh, Ephremi mean that it's not in the original Sinaiticus. At some point, at least three revisors deep, somebody got their hands on Sinaiticus and said, hold on a second, that, that crossbar in the middle shouldn't be there. It, it, it doesn't belong there. This literally means that somebody corrected Sinaiticus, at some point, it wasn't the first guy, it wasn't the second guy, it wasn't the third guy. Somebody just thought it didn't need it there. The same thing with Alexandrinus, the same thing with the Ephremi. Those three are all, they acknowledge all three of them were modified by somebody who wasn't one of the first three people to modify them. Somebody got their hands on them way down the road and changed it, which means in the originals of these three versions, it didn't read like this. Now, well, what did it read like? Well, that's why we have a Nestle's Island Greek New Testament. It says that in Aleph, in the C version, which means the third reviser, that means that before the unknown reviser, when it was in its C revision, it was verified that it read with the theta. Uh, Alexandrinus, in the C version, it was verified that it read with the theta. Uh, the Ephremi in the second version, read with the theta. Uh, 05 and 06, Catabrigensis, and the C version, am I in this? Yeah. The C version, read with the theta. The D version, read with the theta. The Phi version, read with the theta. 
it's manuscript 1739, manuscript 1881, and this wonderful little thing, the majority text. Now, for the reference, the majority text, I brought this up last Sunday, is a collection of 874 manuscripts, largely from the Syrian region up in here, by Antioch, where the church was founded. You can't really emphasize that enough, that it came from around where the church was founded. There's 874 manuscripts that all read largely the same, and they are all contained in this one letter to make it easier for you. So when you actually go to all 874 of them, because they are fragments, they are fragments, 253 of them contain this passage. 250 of them agree that it's a theta. You have all this plus 250 more sources that say that's how it's supposed to read, along with Jerome's Latin Vulgate, which was a Bible translated into Latin, put together by a man named Jerome, who was in the pay of the Catholic Church, and he put together his own Latin Bible. And even he says, guys, that should be a theta. When you go to all these different manuscripts, I have all my notes open here. And this is where I went back here. When you go to all these different things, you start looking into church fathers. Church fathers who preached out of these manuscripts said, hey, I used to have my hands on Alex and Greatness, and when I preached out of it, it said, great is the mystery of God was manifest in the flesh. And they all say, this is how it used to read. Now, there's all kinds of dumb reasons for this, but the big reason for it is that the Sinaiticus looks like this. And you can go home and you look it up and you can find the pictures of it. The, the theta, the crossbar that changed this from an O to a TH, is faded. And they looked at that and they said, this is kind of faded out. It shouldn't be there. Yeah, there's a nomina sacra on top, which is basically like saying this is a capital letter. So if I write something that's all scraggly, but the first letter is capitalized, you know it's a proper noun. Why? Because the first letter is capitalized. There's a nomina sacra over the top. They wrote this out of reverence and respect for God when they translated his version. Hey, here's the word he with the nomina sacra on top, and the crossbar is faded. It should read he. That's what they're doing with their translations. Now, why would somebody do that? Why would they be that dumb? Because, or I'm sorry, Colossians 1.18, that in all things he might have the preeminence. This book, this King James Bible, gives Jesus Christ the preeminence in all things. It assigns, it says Jesus Christ is God. But you get in another version and it just says he. It's talking about a man. It could be talking about anybody. And it takes the preeminence away from Jesus Christ. That's how you know you can't trust it. You say it can't possibly. It is honestly that dishonest. They are, in all honesty, that dishonest with their translation. Why? Why would somebody do that? First reason, they're led of the devil. This book is the perfect inspired truth that you can hang your hat on as a Christian. You can grab onto this book and run with it. And you can say, I will take this at face value to mean what it says and says what it means. And if I have a question, I can ask the author directly. I don't need a priest. We do not. The Bible says there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. If I want to know what this Bible says, I ask God. And you ask people, you say, Pastor, what do you think? You know, Brother Klotz, what do you think about this? And when they tell you, say, pray about it and say, okay, is that right? God, what's their cross references? This is in context. Is this? And use people, learn from them, but... If I say something and the Bible says something else, you run with this. But if I say, well, there's an NIV and there's an ASV, and you're trying to figure out what you're supposed to do, and you're kind of going back and forth with, well, I don't know, well, this. Now you have all these different authorities. And when you have that many different authorities, you are the authority because you decide what the authority is. And let me tell you something. 
neither you nor I will ever know enough Greek to know what the authority should be. Never. It's not possible. Why? Because there, if you study language, there's different versions of languages. Um, there's High German and Low German. And High German and Low German are different. There's, when you look up spellings, there's American English and British English. Uh, gray, how do you spell gray? A for America, E for Europe. They're different. If you go to New Jersey, you say, hey, can I have one of those Johns? What's a John? A John is their word for anything. What is it? It's street. It's, it's, it's the language. It's how they talk. And if a guy, if you go, if a guy from Florida goes to New York City and orders a Coke, and the guy brings him a Coke, he's going to get mad at him. Because if you go to Florida and you, and you want a soda, which is the right way to say it, they say Coke. You say, oh, I want a Coke. Oh, what do you want? I'll have a Mountain Dew. That's how they talk. It's street language. Your Bible is not written in some high-grade, perfectly written-out, illuminated Greek. It's written in what's called koine, which is street language, because Peter was a fisherman. He talked like a fisherman, just cussed a little bit less. Which means that how do you understand a person in New York City? We went to New York City on a youth trip a long time ago. And there was a guy there selling hawk Louis Vuitton purses. And he said a sentence, and I didn't know he was speaking English until he got to the last word. <laughs> Wait, that was English. Okay, why? It's street language. Your Bible's written in street language, which means you don't understand street language unless you live on the street. And it doesn't matter how much time you spent stuck up in a monastery with Greek grammatic, grammatical lexicon, you're not going to understand street language because that's not how you learn street language. You live in it. Now, I understand I'm dealing with a Bible here. You cannot translate something from one language to another perfectly. It is impossible. You can't. You cannot read and appreciate the Odyssey in the original language it was written in because it was written in Greek. You don't understand Greek. You would have to understand Greek in the light it was written in when it was written, which was, I think, 600 B.C. You could never fully appreciate and understand the original Odyssey. And unless... You have some form of supernatural intervention, you cannot have a perfect translation from one language to another. It is impossible. You lose context, you lose nuance. Uh, the King James, there's two ways to translate there's literal and figurative. The literal translation is you take a word for word, take it from Greek into English exactly how it's written. And if your Bible was written like that, you wouldn't get it. <laughs> Why? Because if you read Spanish, if you, if anyone here speaks Spanish, you know that in Spanish, you put the noun before the adjective. The dog, big, red, and fuzzy. You don't say the big, red, fuzzy dog. You say the do dog, big, red, fuzzy. Well, if your Bible read as a little translation, it would be all Greek. Oh, my goodness. You're getting the Greek participles and the stupid. God bless Brother Hayes. That man is a saint. He taught me Greek. But you get into all that mess trying to translate. You can't make it perfect. Then there's, also, then there's the figurative, which is you read it in Greek and say, okay, he's trying to say this. Um, when Jesus is on the cross, it says he cast the same in their teeth. That's not what it says in Greek at all. <laughs> That's a translation to an English idiom. And you say, well, it's, it's a translation of understanding exactly the best you can understand the Greek and the English. So unless God did something supernatural, which he did in this book, you can't have a perfect translation, which means that when you're trying to get into the historical and the lexicons and the context and all this stuff, and you're trying to dig down with your own brain and find the original word of God, you will never find it. You can't. It is impossible. When somebody tries to say in the Greek, what they're doing is they're opening a door to something that they could never understand. Nobody ever can. The Greek language is lost. The original Koine street language is lost. It's dead. You'll never find it. And if you want to root around in a dead language trying to figure out what the English Bible tells you, 
enjoy yourself. Because you're going to be miserable. Those people are miserable. You know how, what, how exciting language is to study? A dead language? And I will say this. From a purely intellectual point of view, you study the brilliance of a King James Version translator, the, the, the men that they had on that committee. You had men who could read and write in four dead languages. <laughs> dead language. Languages nobody speaks. It's not like they went to France and learned it. It's languages nobody speaks, nobody has spoken for a thousand years. I learned it out of a book. There are men on that committee that could read, write, and speak in seven languages. I don't know anybody alive that can do that. Those men were brilliant. So if you were to say, well, it's unfortunate that they chose this translation because I've got a strong concordance and there's three different ways to translate the word agape, then you're an idiot. You don't, you can't match grounds. If you're going to go on your own intellect, you can't stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with those men. They will beat the pants off you in credentials. You're not qualified. I'm not qualified. And when people try and open this door, what they're trying to do is they're trying to blow smoke in your face and bamboozle you. They say, oh, here's all this stuff. And, well, you're just a, one of those dumb old Bible thumbs. You don't know any Greek. You don't believe the Greek. This, uh, this is why you're stupid. Hey, you, want, you think you know Greek? You think you know it? Because you don't. Now, all of this mess, all this dishonesty of why this? Because they're led of the devil. They want a new translation with their name on it. If I put my name on a translation, then some people are after the money. Not everybody's after the money. Some of them are after the money. Some of them are after the, I translated the Bible. Do you get something out of your new King James? Uh, blah. Did you get something out of your new King James version? I was on the committee that helped translate that. That's a, it's that. I did this. I helped you. It is a pride thing. There is no need to correct this. Now, I've said a lot about them being dishonest. You say no, they're not dishonest. They are dishonest. I'll show you why. First Timothy chapter three verse one. We're going to run back. First Timothy chapter three verse one. In the one page that I actually need. It says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be qualifications, blameless, the husband of one wife. Now, there's the whole does this mean the husband of one wife, the, the husband of not a whole bunch of wives? And you, you can go back and forth on that. But what it does say is the husband, which means that a woman, until you can figure out how to be a husband, you can't be a pastor. And that's what the Bible says. That's not what I say. That's what the Bible says. As a woman, you must be the husband of one wife. You, you want to be a lesbian? Okay, be a lesbian. That makes you, in your own terms, the wife of one wife, not the husband. You'll be a trans man, you're still a woman. So what is the Bible? So why do I bring this up? Well, if we go to the Nestle Island Greek New Testament, and we open it up to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, and you read through it, and you get down to the section where it says the husband of one wife. It's, uh, it's mias gunaikos andra. My, let's see, gunai. You know, wife of a man, the wife of a man, man, a husband of one wife. In that text, there are no markings. There's no replacement text. There's no word order text. In every single known manuscript, in every single language, quoted by every single church father, they all agree that it says the husband of one wife. There is no controversy at all on what the original languages say and what they meant. So when you walk into a church with a woman pastor and you sit down in the pew and you pick up the Bible, they have, and it's an RSV, and you open the RSV, and it says, married once for no reason, you know you're dealing with the devil. It is so 
obscenely dishonest to translate it that way. But a woman will do that to put herself in the pulpit because that verse objectively disqualifies her. So she finds so somebody out there who wants to correct the Bible puts out a version that says married once, and then a woman becomes qualified to pastor, and then we can get out of the will of God and do it. That's what your new versions do. That's how messed up it is. There is no Greek support at all, zero. There's no Latin support. There's no Coptic support. There's no uh, Boharic support. There's no early church father support. There's no Latin. There's no cursives. And there's no unseals. There's no Syriac. There's no Boharic. There's nothing. What is it? It is an honest-to-goodness, dishonest translation of the Bible. And you don't have that in the King James. There's places where the King James and the majority text will disagree. There's places where the King James will disagree with just about everybody. <laughs> Get into the Easter debate and all that stuff. Yeah, there's places where it disagrees, absolutely. But dishonest in translation? Never. <laughs> Never. And that's why I tell you, that's why I'm teaching all this to show you, hey, there's a whole world of just other translations out there, and there's all this big fight about the Greek and the English and the and the Bible and all this stuff, and while you King James only people, I want you to know that when that argument comes up, you don't have to be afraid of it. You don't have to be like, well, I don't know. I'm just going to believe, I'm just going to believe the King James Bible is the word of God in ignorance. I don't want you to believe it in ignorance. I want you to know. And I want you to be secure in it because as I was going through trying to teach 2 Thessalonians, I'm trying to get it together. I'm trying as best I can. I did it some last night, and it did not come out right. Uh, two nights ago, and it did not come out right. Um, one of the things that's marked by Paul, where he says, when you get close to the end, of the end times, one of the biggest things you're going to see is false translations of the Bible. He's got people teaching false doctrine about when the rapture is going to happen. He's got people corrupting the word of God. He's got people writing letters saying they're Paul when they're not. People writing letters saying they're Bible when they're not. And you're stuck in a nasty situation. <laughs> Wish me better. Yes, your italics, none of, yes, and no other version has italics. In your King James Bible, when they got to a spot where they say, okay, it's missing a word here to make grammatical sense, um, that sounds, I, I can't put that verse exactly, but yes, but when it got to a point where it says, okay, this doesn't make grammatical sense, or there's no way to translate this from, from Greek into English, because you get in other languages, they don't have words for words that we have A words. There's, I don't think there's a Greek word for A. So when you say Andros, man, it could, the translation of, man, of Andros is man or a man. So which one is it? I don't know. You can't really know. So whenever the King James translators got to a spot where they said, this needs a word to make sense in English, they put it in italics. First Timothy, I'm not even there, but they, they put it in italics so that you would know we're being honest here. We added this. Now, are the italics inspired? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Where are we? First Timothy 3.11? Yeah. It, you, so, yeah, take First Timothy 3.11. If you remove, if you just take the transliteral, and what it says, quote, unquote, in the, in the Greek, it says, even so, wives grave. <laughs> it's like, okay. It makes no sense, yeah. So, but they, in, in their honesty, said, we're going to put it in the italics. And no other version does that. And they all use their own version of, you know, we've had to add in words to make it make sense. And none of them will do that for you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is, this is a gigantic question. I believe Pastor taught this once and took him six months to teach it. But the short answer is, 
if I become divorced biblically, I don't have a wife. So I have zero wives. And then if I get married again, I have one wife. Yes. Mm -hmm. Think something, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just move on with my life. Yeah, there is. Biblically, no. And the, the issue with that is if I'm in a position where just like, oh, I just want a new wife and I go get one, like, just in context, that person has no business being a pastor. <laughs> you know, you're, you're not, at that point, you're just doing it because you do it. Very handsome. So what is the scholarship on other versions? Mm-hmm. So what's your question? For, for the King James? The King James is put together from three different sources, three different sources, and I'm, I'm running over time here, so I'm going to be quick about it. Um, and I, can't, I can never remember the third guy. Uh, but there's talk about how to put together your Greek of I use Matthew from Sinaiticus, Mark from Alexandrinus, and Luke from Vaticanus, and then to put together your New Testament, you're going to say, I'm going to take Matthew from Ephraimai, uh, Mark from Majority Text, and Luke from Sinaiticus. That's my Greek version, then you have your Greek version. The King James came from three different major three Greek versions. Um, there was a man named Biza. Biza put together six different Greek versions. They used Biza's fifth Greek version. They used the Elzeva brothers' third Greek version, and they used another guy, and I can't remember his name, but they used his, one of his Greek versions. And between the three of them, and really, their source material is, it's those three Greek versions. Uh, then you, on top of that, there were seven translations, or sorry, six translations of the Bible into English before then. John Wycliffe did his own translation. And John Wycliffe was such a good writer that they said, when you stylistically can maintain the rhetoric of John Wycliffe, do it. Because he wrote it well. <laughs> he wrote it in a way that people understood it, and it was right, and it was great. They said, so... You know, when you can write like Wycliffe, write like Wycliffe. Um, they used some Latin. They used some, uh, I don't think they used much Coptic. They didn't use much O'Hare. They, they used basically everything they could find. They used a lot of German. They used Luther's German. And what they did is they looked at all these sources. They weighed the sources. They prayed about it. They figured out the best, God, what did you say here? How do we say this in English? And God led those men to write the Bible as it is. The way that God uses it is because these men did what God wanted them to, to the absolute best of their human capability, 
while maintaining their walk with God, when you read about the walks with God that all of these men had, every single one of them had a personal friend that had been burned to death by the Catholic Church. All 63 of them. Personally. Friends. Lost. Uh, also, I believe all 63 of them were ministers in some capacity. And it was multi-denominational. There were a bunch of different denominations present during the translation. They are, were trying as best they could with the most honest heart they could to translate that Bible into English for the common people. And they used a whole bunch of different sources. And the way they would do it is they'd have a committee of about four men would translate. And then they would take that translation and they would ship it to somebody else to back check them. And they would put it out of their hands and they put it in somebody else's hands. Do that with every single verse in your Bible. That's, that's the level of scrutiny that they had. So if you've got one screwball in here being an idiot and, oh, he's got to translate this way, and he's wrong, which I don't think there were any screwballs in the Trinitarian Translational Committee, that's how it worked. Yes, ma'am. So there's, so there's two reasons for that. And this is where it gets really hard because it's impossible to know somebody else truly. Um, I am not perfect. <laughs> Duh, everybody. Um, but I heard Dennis Knowles preach one time, and he said, God can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. I have heard women pastors, women preachers, say things that are true and are right and say, okay, yep, that, that's right, and I can use that but they will never reach the capacity to which God wants them to reach. They're out of line. And when you get out of line, you can still do something for God. If you go out soul winning every single day of your life for eight hours a day, you don't provide for your family, you don't read your Bible, you don't pray, you'll probably still win a couple people to Jesus Christ, which is good, but you're doing it the wrong way and you're not, doing, you're not knowing God in the way that he intended to. That's part of it. The other part of it is, it's flesh. I realize, like, this Bible says things that are offensive. This Bible says things that are, that say, hey, it, I mean, the Bible literally says, hey, woman, you can't, duh, 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 duh. That does, uh, ladies, that's the Bible. And I know that that doesn't make you feel good. And I, un I understand it doesn't make you feel good. The Bible says, men, do these things. Not everything in there makes me feel good. And conforming is hard. And it goes against my flesh and it goes against my nature to believe the things that some things that have been told me my whole life and the Bible says different, I have to go with that. If I just made everybody in here feel good all the time, it would prosper. <laughs> but it is prosperity, it's not just prosperity gospel. It's just make everybody feel good, everybody get along, everybody come to church, have a good time, have a nice time, enjoy each other. Let's fellowship, let's have cookies and the coffee in the back, and all go home friends but you don't get to know God. You will not get to know God. And when you're going against what you know as scripture, uh, you will never know God, not in the way that you're supposed to. Uh, if you've got more questions, I'll answer them afterwards, but we've run right up to time, so we'll start about 10 minutes after. Um, but let's pray and be dismissed. Lord, we love you, God. We thank you for a perfect word in English. I pray you help us to love it, help us to trust it. I pray that something I said here this morning would make sense. I pray that it'd be a help to your people, God, and I pray you forgive me for going over and just bless your 
Help us the preaching and the singing and all that's coming this morning, God. In Jesus' name, amen. If anybody else has questions, I can talk.